Perez? Here. Rinfleisch? Here. Stephan? Excuse. Van Akron? Here. Vanderweel? Here. Wangeman? Here. Warner? Here. Wenninger? Here. 15 present. Quorum's present. Alderman Graf. Your Honor, I'll make motion that the minutes of the previous Common Council be approved as, as entered in the record. To move and second that the minutes of the previous Common Council be approved under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Alderman Baumann, would you lead us in a pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have one hearing this evening, and that reads only property located at 1427 South 15th Street. Anyone wishing to be heard on the hearing? Any interest parties wishing to be heard on the hearing? Alderman McGraw? Yeah, now I'll move that the hearing be closed. Moved and second that the hearing be closed under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Confirmation of appointments. Now this was <coughs> dated October 6th uh, from the mayor. <coughs> Hereby submit the following appointments to the Business Improvement District for your consideration. Tricia Fippen to be considered for the unexpired term of Bill Dawson, whose term expires September 16, uh, 2005. Reappoint Rick Scroggins and Tammy Kennard for a three year term to expire 9 1606. Appoint Craig Mazza to replace Lynn Rouse, whose term expires 9-16-03. Craig Mazza's term will expire on 9-16-06. Again, signed by the mayor. Okay. If she wants to both at once. Um, and the other is the mayor's appointments to the Special Municipal Court Investigation Committee. And uh, once again, the appointments there are Alderman Michael Warner, Alderman William Wangeman, myself, Sergeant Robert Gutowski, Attorney David Gass, Ronald Beenan, citizen, and Ronald Erline, citizen. All terms expiring October 15, 2004. Signed by the mayor. Alderman Graff. And I'll move that off. Appointments be confirmed. Move to second that appointments be confirmed. Under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Public forum. <coughs> Susan Hundley. Good evening. I'm Susan Hundley, 632 Michigan Avenue, Sheboygan. I'm here just for one purpose, and that's to address the room tax issue. And uh, that's because two individuals did bring this topic up at the last public forum two weeks ago. Um, there were a few statements made that I consider incorrect, and I just wanted to clarify them. One uh, said that room tax issue could only be decided by uh, elected officials. That's not correct mm. at all. Uh, you can read the state statute to verify that. Another statement was made saying that we were going to be taking uh, taxpayers' money and putting it into our own pockets. That's definitely not true. Uh, first, we have not sued the city. We did file, Renee, Susha, and myself, uh, two lodging owners, a notice of claim. And that was only after three and a half years of trying to negotiate and um, over 22 meetings that were attended by lodging. And these meetings were <coughs> council meetings, chamber meetings, and some were requests from special groups to meet with us. We went into all these meetings very open-minded, hoping to resolve these issues. The very last thing that we wanted to do was to get into a lawsuit. But then our, we did hire an attorney to advise us. It didn't seem to be going any place. Our attorney did meet with the city attorney for three hours, and our attorney, by the way, is a person that is considered 
the room tax law expert in the state of Wisconsin. He actually has written a book. Many municipalities purchase this book, and they use it as a guide once they enact room tax law. And uh, he came to Sheboygan and met with our city attorney. And after the meeting, he, because um, we'd planned future meetings with him, and uh, the attorney had hoped to, our attorney, I should say, had hoped to meet with the mayor and maybe some other groups that were interested. He told us he didn't feel this was in the best interest, and we are paying this attorney by the hour. So uh, after encouragement and actually suggestions by two city officials, we did file the notice claim. During this time, we were never contacted, Renee or I. A third party was, and it was brought to his attention that he should maybe discuss us dropping this notice of claim. Rather perplexed us that somebody else would be involved and not us. But uh, we didn't have any say because we were never contacted. We were given a notice that, through certified mail, that it was discarded. So the next step would be to sue the city. We haven't done that. We do have six months. We are hoping for some negotiation during this time. We have not heard. If it would go into court, it should not. It was stated in the last public forum that we would be costing the city taxpayers steep legal fees to defend the case. Shouldn't cost the city one penny. We have a city attorney that has advi been advising the mayor and all of you saying that we are following state statute regarding room tax law in Sheboygan. Shouldn't cost you a penny. It will cost us money, and when we win, we will want to be reimbursed. That's where the city would have some expenditures. Our only goal is for the city to follow state statute regarding room tax law. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. John Gussie. John, you'll have five minutes. <clears throat> Mayor Schramm, ladies and gentlemen of the city of Sheboygan, I'm addressing you this evening on a few concerns that I have, as well as most of the citizens of Sheboygan have. While looking at the pending budget, mounting deficit, and increasing in fees, and the addition of fees that this Common Council has created, are you truly doing your guidance as part of the city of Sheboygan? There are two things a governing body has an obligation to the citizenry that has put you in power. The citizens have, number one, the right of protection, and number two, the developing and sustaining of a stable and robust eco economic structure. The first is our right of protection. This lies in the hands of our police and our fire department, with both stand substantial cuts in this upcoming budget. First is the fire department, which stands up to a quarter of a million dollar budget cut, having the potential of laying off three firefighters in this city. Yet on the south side of this city alone, we have one fire station taking almost half of our load, which also houses our industrial park. Most businesses that go underneath a catastrophic fire will be out of business within two years. Are we willing to take the risk in our manufacturing and industrial area with that risk? To say nothing of the people who pay the taxes and go home every day and having their lives and their property put on the line with this fire department in their hands. These are the same people that are considering wage decreases or having their wages frozen to save the jobs. Definitely showing the spirit of the people that will bravely go in as everybody else wants to run out. They will band together, never leaving the fallen man behind. Yet tonight, just look in the paper to see that we're also looking at increases in wages of other people, yet they're looking to stop theirs. The next step is the police department looking facing almost a half a million dollar budget cut. A half a million dollar budget cut. Have we not listened to the news? Have we not seen that this city is facing a drug problem? I know people who live in neighborhoods that these drug houses have popped up. This is a neighborhood that I grew up in. And what about the tragedies that we have seen on our streets, having young people's lives taken? Where were the police to stop some of these drug drivers? Second of all, and the last thing, is how about now a prostitution ring involving a child, a 13-year-old child, and we're gonna stand let and let this happen? Second is the economic structure. By increasing fees, assessments, stormwater fees, and things along that line, we are going to strain the industrial power that this city definitely does has and has shown for over 150 years. These businesses are not going to be able to take that hit. You're going to take money from the research and development fees, employment, employee development, marketing, and just overall profitability of the business. How will they make money? Getting rid of jobs, getting rid of everyone. These are going to affect the union jobs, 
the non-union jobs from executive to entry level. This is going to affect the mom and pop to the major industrial people in our in manufacturing sector. I hope these city takes these, most of these issues to heart when you're looking at the proposal and making your final recommendations. Because I would like to see this city go back from the 12th highest tax, according to some stats, to number one place in America to raise a family. You drive down the streets, you see them every day. These people work hard for their money. They're good people, as well as you're good people, and I hope you see that, that they need to be represented or represented fairly. On the other hand, changes need to be made on major decisions that do affect stormwater fees, major funding for private development. These need to be brought to public referendum. The people need to be heard. The people need to be make sure that their voices were heard. 29 businesses stood in front of you, 28 opposed, one stood up here and defended it, yet the stormwater fee goes through. What is that gonna to affect to the local business structure? I hope you take a lot of this in there. And I know a few of you, as I've talked to you, feel the same way that I do. And I hope you stand up and let this rest of this council know how you have felt as you have expressed this to me. Because there's a, a true proverb that the world will follow one person who knows where they're going. Mayor Schramm, ladies and gentlemen of Sheboygan, I thank you and God bless. Thank you, John. John, just to clarify one thing, this is not pay raises going to the employees. This is paperwork following up for the ranges to readjust the ranges. There are no raises attached to this, nor will there be any raises attached to any of these salaries. So it, you may have misconstrued the way the paper printed it, but there are no raises going to, to non-rep employees with this. It's restructuring. And Donnie, you may want to talk about that. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm the head of the Salary Grievance Department. This has not come up in the Salary Grievance yet. It's first coming up Thursday. And there will be no raises for any person. All they're doing is expanding the, from the low to the high. There will be no raises whatsoever in that document you're reading wrong. The other thing, John, just to clarify, to correct is, yes, there were 29 business people up here, but not 20, let me back up, 28 did not oppose it. There are several who spoke against it. I spoke to some of the business people that were up here. They were up here to listen, get information. They talked to me about it. They did not oppose the stormwater fee. Just because they didn't get up to the microphone and express their opinion doesn't mean they were up here opposing it. They want to get the information from there. Jamie Schramm. Good evening. I again thank you for allowing me to speak with you this evening and for sharing five minutes of your time. Two weeks ago, I challenged us as a community to turn away from the campaign of deception, diversion, and disrespect launched from this microphone and suggested we embrace the values of hope, opportunity, and progress. I also made a promise to present the facts whenever and wherever they were being misrepresented. In the past two weeks, the campaign of deception, diversion, and disrespect have continued their assault upon the truth. There's an old saying in politics that if a lie is if a lie is allowed to be told long enough, it becomes truth. Such inaccuracies must be challenged. My favorite one over the past two weeks is the assertion that the budget challenges we face are because of the money being spent on the Blue Harbor Project. This, despite the fact Alderman Warner and the mayor both laid out information contrary two weeks ago. The fact is, there is no line in the upcoming 2004 city budget that allocates one cent of general fund tax dollars to Blue Harbor. None. Zero. Blue Harbor is funded through the TIF district in which it resides, not general fund dollars. Along with this is the wild assertion the owners of Blue Harbor will have their property taxes frozen until 2018. Again, the facts tell a different story. In an effort to protect local taxpayers, the city's leadership made certain a minimum tax payment was made each year to the city, and with the project's success, Great Lakes will likely pay more than the minimum guaranteed tax payment. We also heard again this past week that Sheboygan is the 12th highest in taxes in the country. But again, the facts tell a different story. This report, done by a firm in the East Coast, covered the entire Sheboygan metro area. In other words, the entire county, and compared its property values to tax rates. The Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance, a Wisconsin group, did a similar study, which was recently highlighted in the Sheboygan Press on October 7th, 2003. The city of Sheboygan, let me repeat, the city of Sheboygan ranked 191st out of 220 communities included in the Taxpayers Alliance study. Instead of 12th highest, the city of Sheboygan is 29th lowest 
out of 220 municipalities. In Sheboygan County alone, the city is ranked behind Howard's Grove, Plymouth, Oostburg, and Sheboygan Falls in tax rates over the last 10 years. Additionally, while city tax rates have averaged a 4.6% 4 4 increase below the state average of 5.1%, property values have risen better than 9.4%. That's a significant return on one's investment. It means our city's leaders, all of you, are spending our tax dollars wisely. Alderman Bill Steffen was indeed correct two weeks ago when he stated the voices concerned about high taxes must now make their case to the Sheboygan School Board and Sheboygan County Board, which, by the way, is proposing 2.75% raises for their employees. Zero percent. What does it mean? When the Mayor and Common Council pass a budget with a zero percent tax rate increase, they will be subjected to the same definition of zero that past leaders have followed for decades. Yet now, some in our midst wish to change the definition. No one has said there won't be increases in our property values, which, by the way, happens to be a good thing. Yet we have heard every reason why zero just isn't zero. Have we not, have we not all heard this before? Did we not have a former president when asked if he smoked marijuana in college respond, yeah, but I didn't inhale? We need to stand up for the truth, for decency. How often does the media turn the other way, publishing the opinions of the self-serving rather than investigating the truth? Lies sell market share, sell newspapers. Lies are interesting, exciting. The truth is plain and simple, black and white. It is easier to gossip and spread the lies, engage in deception, diversion, and disrespect than it is to have the courage to stand up for the values of hope, opportunity, and progress, the values we teach our children. We can learn a lot, though, by following the values we teach our children. My six-year-old son loves to play soccer. This is the ball he uses to practice. I've never been much, one much for soccer, so we're learning together. I'm convinced, however, that regardless of how great a soccer player he becomes, he is learning some very important life lessons on the soccer field. Six years old, and he's beginning to understand. He will not always win, he may not always be the best, and he certainly cannot lie, steal, and cheat his way to the top. Criticizing the other team doesn't make him or his team any better. Practice and hard work make him a better player, enable him, him to uplift his team. Six years old, I can see it in his actions on the field and in his comments to his teammates. He gets it. Six years old. Too bad some of us much older haven't learned lessons from the soccer field. I invite you all to come out and play a game. That same six-year-old loves the color. This is the box of crayons he uses. Right now, his favorite color is blue. I'm certain there are some people gathered here tonight who try to convince us this is red, green, yellow, anything but blue. Certainly it can't be black or white because they thrive on finding the gray. But this is blue. It's blue because our tradition tells us it's blue, common sense tells us it's blue, our values tell us it's blue, and the Binney and Smith Crayola Company of Eastern, Eastern Pennsylvania tells us it's blue. Blue also happens to be the color of the sky. Despite all the criticisms leveled against our hometown and all the lies that have been told, the sky is not falling. Tomorrow the sun's going to come up. I'm not promising 75 in late October, but the sun will come up in Sheboygan, and you know what? We're going to be all right. I always Amy? tell... Sorry. Thank you. God bless. Marty Butson. Okay, my name is Marty Butson, and I'm the manager of Screamers Tavern. Um, I'm here today in regard to the sign we currently have on our lower roof. This sign is a fiberglass race car shell that's professionally painted with our logo, our name. Um, we spent about $5,000 to have this car made and then lifted onto our lower roof. We were not aware at the time that we needed a sign permit, so we were ordered to take the sign down or apply for a variance for a conditional use permit. So we spent another $150 to apply for a conditional use permit so that we could comply and be, you know, we want to obey the law. Um, but we were denied. The reasons for denial were based on aesthetics and, um, their, and the city planning committee's hesitancy to set precedents for anyone in the future wanting to do the same thing. After the last vote by the planning committee, which was three, two, and one, um, three voted for denial, two in favor, and then one abstained. Um, I was approached by Bob Petrie from the Sheboygan Press, <coughs> who informed me that he would like to interview me for a story that he was you know, going to do for the paper. Well, our issue made the front page of the paper, and then Jerry Bader called me from WHBL, and he wanted to do an interview, which I did. And uh, he had an hour-long program where um, callers you know, call in to voice their opinion. He had over 30 callers, and not one negative comment was made by anyone that called in. Um, 
Every person said that our sign looked great and professionally done. Some said it actually improved the look of the area and its surroundings. Um, they said it was creative and imaginative way to promote our business. And some people went as far as to call it art. <laughs> Um, from race fans to small business owners to ordinary citizens, we received so many positive comments and so many people offering their support that I couldn't help but wonder if there wasn't a chance to change the City Planning Committee's mind about our issue. So on Tuesday, um, October 14th, I called Mayor Schramm and he said that I had an opportunity to address the council, so here I am. On Tuesday, October 14th, a petition was also started to keep our sign and um, we have over 1,500 signatures in six days. Um, what I'm asking the Common Council to do is send our issue back to the City Planning Committee for reconsideration. I really feel that when the committee members see the overwhelming support for our sign, aesthetics will no longer be an issue. I mean, over 1,500 people think it looks wonderful. Um, when they see all the signatures of small business owners, citizens, and especially the, the lack of negative feedback, they will have the basis they need to grant us a conditional use permit. You know, they'll, they'll have the basis they need to set a precedence in granting us our conditional use permit to keep our sign up. And uh, so what I would like to do is ask that you send the matter back to the City Planning Committee. And I would also like to request that if you do do that, um, we would like to keep the sign up there until such time as the City Planning's decision uh, comes back to us again. Um, our original, or our deadline right now is November 1st. So I assume it would be the first Planning Committee in November, the first meeting. And that's all I have to say, and I really thank you very much, and I appreciate the chance to be up here. Marty, we have nothing to send back because there's no document on the council floor this evening. Just for the petition. That. A petition, but Alderman Warner is chairman, and Alderman Warner, if you'd be open to inviting, well, I'm Hi. chairman, but you're a council person on there. If you'd invite uh, Marty back to the plan commission and discuss this. Absolutely. Okay, so great. we'll get you on the next agenda. Yeah. Okay, great. And okay, I'm sorry. Can, can we have the time to, can we keep our sign up in the meantime? Steve had some. Tuesday. Oh, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, under our zoning code, the, the plan commission is the final decision maker on conditional uses. Uh, it's not a council decision. Council adopted the zoning code that provides for the uh, plan commission to act on conditional uses. Uh, the conditional use was denied. The, uh, there's not any action before the city council. Well, I understand that. Um, but we just received so much support and so many um, people rallying for us to be able to keep our sign. I felt that it was appropriate to come here tonight um, and it was appropriate to ask the city planning committee for just some cons uh, uh, re to reconsider their um, their, their decision. You know, 16, all close to 1,600 people think our sign is aesthetically beautiful um, or aesthetically appropriate for the city of Sheboygan. And um, the fact that we were denied based on aesthetics and the fact that we were denied based on um, hesitancy to set precedents, I think this would be the perfect reason to set a precedence. If you can say to someone, I have you know, over 1,500 signatures saying we love it and no negative comments, that's a perfect um, situation to say, yeah, okay. Marty, you're done. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Alderman Pratt. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I, my question was going to be the one, the answer I just got from Steve as to why a council had no final right. authority over it. Now I can understand why, why we don't. So, thank you. Alderman Vanderweel. Vanderweel. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'd just like to ask Steve, can the commission vote on it again and change their decision, or is their decision final, or can the commission change that? Uh, I'd have to look, I guess, at the zoning code on uh, reconsideration, but typically uh, the, the city ordinance provides uh, under the Roberts rules and the, uh, the, uh, the city's uh, manifestation of the Roberts rules is that reconsideration can only be done at the same meeting where the original underlying vote is taken, that you can't uh, act to reconsider something at a subsequent meeting. 
That's contrary to Robert's rules, but that's what our, our code provides. So, and the council sets the rules of the council. Uh, so I would, I would think not, but I can take a look at what the zoning code provides after the meeting. Okay. One more speaker. Oh, hang on. All of my friends, we're not done yet. Okay. We got a couple more. <laughs> thank, thank you, Your Honor. I guess I'm, uh, I'm a little intrigued by all the support this, this issue has gathered, but I realize that a motion to reconsider would be inappropriate, but a motion to rescind perhaps might be more in order according to the rules of order. Also, an ordinance can be changed by a council vote, can it not? So the council could actually change the ordinance to, to allow. There is some room, as I can feel, there is some room for approval of this sign. We're looking at it in one way, but it can also be looked in the other. So there's, there's some latitude there that I see that the council might want to consider. Council as a whole could change the zoning code. That would require a zoning amendment, which would require a public hearing and going through the process for zoning change, yes. Problem is that wouldn't help Marty in time before she had to take it down because that takes too much, it's too long a process to get I, I believe they were ordered, you know, many, many months ago to take the sign down uh, and then <clears throat> then sought to go to the plan commission for a conditional use, uh, you know, after maybe Steve Sokolowski from the planning department can address the, uh, the process that's taken place. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, Alderman Warner, first, do you, need, do you have something to say? Uh, yes, uh, Your Honor, one thing for sure is I, I would be very resistant to looking at changing any of our, our zoning codes or our sign ordinance at this time that was put into place based on, on laws around the state and around the nation that have such such uh, sign ordinances. It's part of our comprehensive plan, which the city paid a lot for, that came out in, in 2000. And and we have to be very careful when we do that. There is a mechanism in there at the plan commission that will allow something like this to happen, and the plan commission could have allowed it. We don't need to change our sign ordinance or a comprehensive plan to allow it. The plan commission simply felt, and this is my belief, that the sign, first, no one really thought the sign was unattractive in any way. The main problem is, is it was a rooftop sign, and we have very few rooftop signs. If you allow one, the next person puts theirs up without asking, now their sign is up, now they have to go th through the same process. Eventually what you're doing is every time someone puts up a sign when they shouldn't have, and it's a non-conforming sign, the people have to look at every one and try to decide which one is appropriate at this time. Is this one okay? That one okay? Is this car on top of the building okay? Is this airplane on top of that building okay? And that was the feeling we had. And as the plan commission changes and the mayor changes, every time the plan commission gets together to discuss the sign, they're looking at different people with different viewpoints and different ideas of what's, of what's, what's appropriate and what looks nice and what doesn't look nice you would have signs of all different kinds all over the place and pretty soon it would look like cartoon land or could look like cartoon land and that was our concern. We've made churches keep their signs back the setback distance. We've, we've made them abide by our sign ordinance plus many other uh, companies and businesses with signs. So we looked at it thoroughly, we looked at it twice, but I have no problem looking at it again in planning commission. Okay, thank you. Steve? Thanks, Mayor. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the history. I know there's been a lot of press. There's been a lot of stuff on the radio. I think it's fair for the planning department to also give you um, an, an, an idea as to what has occurred throughout this matter. Um, it was in November of last year that we did receive a complaint about the sign. Anytime staff receives a complaint, we check it out to see if it's compliant with today's zoning ordinance. This, in fact, was not. A letter was written to the Bootsons for Screamers indicating that the sign was not compliant and they must either remove the sign or apply for a conditional use and variance. That was the only way to have the sign as is allowed at the site. Presently in the urban commercial zone, um, there are different types of signs that are allowed, wall signs, awning signs, and there was never any type of issues in terms of the NASCAR motif or anything like that. It was with the fact that the zoning ordinance, which Alderman Warner stated um, with regards to the comp plan and the uh, zoning ordinance, which was amended in 1996, there was a lot of time and effort spent by the public, by the planning commission, by the council, in fact, by sign companies, that focus specifically on the signs. And this was one of the results of that 
study was to, to limit roof signs, not to have them. So the only way was for them to apply for this conditional use and variance, which they did. Um, subsequently, in uh, November, the plan commission reviewed it and denied it. They were informed to remove the sign by March 1st of 2003. There was a lot of communication back and forth with regards to letters, which uh, the applicant decided to disregard. Um, they were informed that they, were, they could apply again with a conditional use permit after six months, which they did. The plan commission again reviewed it recently and, and voted to deny it. And subsequently, they've been given a time frame of November 1 to remove the sign. So it's, I think it's important for the council to be aware of this. And uh, as uh, Attorney McLean indicated, uh, the plan commission is final decision maker on this. Um, the applicant in another six months could apply for another conditional use permit. And uh, um, again, staff does feel that in terms of amending the ordinance, I definitely um, and, and our department does not feel that is the way to go. Um, are there situations like this that we should uh, take a look at on an individual basis through a variance? Yes, that I think we can do. But to amend the ordinance does not, uh, I believe, rectify this or doesn't uh, provide a solution. Thank you, Steve. No, she can't speak. Okay, we have someone else? Yeah, she, she wants to speak, but she can't. Okay. Marty, I, you had five minutes or whatever, so. Steve I, Kiefer. Good evening. Marty, thanks for uh, making a little noise. You give me a chance to talk. My name's Steve Kiefer. Some of you I know from a long time ago. Others I haven't seen for a while. I operate a sign company in Sheboygan. Almost everything I produce I ship somewhere else in the country. You may see it on a truck heading south. Very occasionally we install a sign in Sheboygan, but this is not our normal <coughs> business. But we, tonight you're talking about something that is important to me, and that's Sheboygan Sign Ordinance. I'm highly active on a national basis with my International Trade Association. Last year I was chairman of the board. This year I'm chairman of our Government Relations Committee. I manage a staff that includes five attorneys, Dr. James Claus, who's considered to be the national expert on signage. In fact, he created the word in 1976. The attorneys are experts in signed ordinances and constitutional law. I participate as well as directing their activities. And while I'm not an attorney, I've certainly learned a lot about signed ordinances, constitutional law, federal law. I've worked with communities since 1979 on signed ordinances, as diverse as Manitowoc and Waukegan, Illinois. I noticed Steve turn his head towards me when he said sign companies worked on the Sheboygan ordinance. I did not. I asked to participate, and that was denied me. I am highly concerned about the Sheboygan Zoning Ordinance, specifically the sign ordinance, interpretation and implementation of that ordinance. I have discussed my concerns with the Planning Department more than once. The mayor and, and people from that department have met with me. I provided to them the same publications all of you received on Friday. Yet I continue to see actions that show a lack of understanding, that show censorship of speech, violation of basic civil rights of the U.S. Constitution, its amendments, and numerous Supreme Court rulings. Simply stated, signs are speech. They're no different than the newspaper or the magazine you read. Speech is protected by the First Amendment. The U.S. Supreme Court rulings have made it abundantly clear that the burden of proof for any regulations of speech rests with the city, not with the business owner. A city cannot subjectively assert a claim such as aesthetics or even traffic safety. As a reason for controlling speech, there must be factual proof behind the regulations, not subjective assertions of visual appeal or dislike by a handful of people. As far back as 1945 and as, as recent as 2001, the U.S. Supreme Court has addressed local actions which censor speech and has re rejected those actions. Beginning in 1975 and in subsequent Supreme Court cases, they established very clear rules to interpret compliance. This is not new knowledge. 
However, I do see it being repeatedly ignored by members of the planning profession throughout our country. But yet I have hope, because uh, two years ago I listened to a tape by the, the number one legal expert that advises their profession stand up in a seminar at their national conference and tell them that 90% of the ordinances, the sign ordinances in the United States are illegal. This is the same guy that taught them to do all the stuff we have in our current ordinance. Ramifications to a city can be quite harmful. I direct your attention to the sign line you all received that talks about North Olmsted, Ohio. This legal action, which the local merchants won, in addition to the costs the city had to pay to defend themselves because it was brought under federal civil rights law, cost the city paying back the plaintiff's fees and attorney fees over $300,000. This is one example. Additionally, I must tell you I'm concerned when I see city staff refuse to grant permits for signs that are allowed under the present ordinance and instead coerce people to install smaller signs. Signs which the staff considers to be appealing. Monument signs which nationally recognized traffic safety engineers indicate are a traffic safety hazard. I believe this raises serious prior restraint and due process concerns based on how I've been educated. On other occasions when a business stands up for their rights, then the city staff gives in and grants them a sign permit. I don't know how Sheboygan's ordinance was written. I didn't participate. But I can share with you that as an official representative of my trade association, I've participated in meetings with multiple departments at the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. I can tell you that HUD is highly concerned about the use of federal funds, block grants, to pay for the development of local ordinances, such as a sign ordinance, which violate federal law. I can also tell you that the people in the Small Business Administration have become highly concerned <coughs> about restrictive illegal sign ordinances and the serious negative impact they have on small business success and the collateral behind SBA guaranteed loans. Steve, your time is up. Good. <laughs> Sorry about Thank that. Thank you. I tell you a lot more for hours and hours. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Not tonight. That's okay. all. I have one, <clears throat> one communication uh, that was sent to me today. It's from Mr. Craig Wagner. And subject is tonight's council meeting. Sorry that I won't be there tonight, but I feel, but feel free to quote me on anything. Quite honestly, this is getting out of hand and needs to come to a halt. Recently, there have been many attacks against you and members of the council, some of which I submit, submitted to the editor of the Sheboygan Press. I would like to take credit for that letter, but the editor took the liberty of changing portions of my letter to not reflect my opinions. So don't believe everything you read. I haven't heard any advice or suggestions on how to resolve the current physical woes from the citizens. It is easy to criticize, but it takes a little time and effort to come up with better ideas. I would suggest that we try to find other alternatives to raising taxes, creating fees, reducing earnings, or eliminating services, and find better and more efficient ways to providing services that make Sheboygan what it is. We may not have we may have to compromise on some of these, but don't take the easy way out. How can this be done? I don't have the answer to that, but that is why the citizens have elected you and the council members. Now it is time to serve the people. I also have to give you credit for attempting to keep the city's portion of the taxes stable by seeking a 5% reduction to the department budgets. Consider the many cuts that have come from Madison. It takes a courageous mayor who by doing so has come under attack and possibly risking his political future for the betterment of the people to me. That is serving the citizens. I am also upset with some of the members of the council. The people of Sheboygan have elected them to represent us. During, during common council and other meetings, there are many times, as well as other citizens of Sheboygan, excuse me, there are on my time, they are on my time, as well as citizens of Sheboygan, and they should act accordingly. Common Council meetings are not for personal gain, nor is it a soapbox, in attempts to further their political careers. I would suggest that they campaign on their own time and do what is right for people when representing us. I have one last question I would like to ask. When did being the mayor, 
council members or any other government employee change from being a service to the people to self-serving people. Maybe if we got back to serving the people, things wouldn't be so difficult. Thank you, Craig Wagner. Put that on. I'll stamp and I'll put on document for tomorrow. Okay. Getting to the agenda. 14.1 through 14.30. Except the... No, no, no. 14.1 to 14.23. 14.23. Excuse me. You're right. 14.23. That's what I'm here for. You're right. Except the suits that are coming from the north side, 1410, 1411, and 1414. I would like to hold those till the next council meeting. And did I miss one? 1413, two? No, that was no. a different one. No. 1410, 1411, and 1414. I would hold those for the next council meeting. And Steve? They're not uh, going to go back to. No, okay. just hold them in council. Steve, would you like to comment on that, where we're at with that? Uh, those claims relate to the sewer backups stemming from the uh, power failure at the North Avenue pump station back in August, I believe. And uh, uh, we're going to be, uh, after we get some further information from our uh, engineering consultant, Donahue and Associates, we had uh, as engineering consultant for that project, we're going to be uh, communicating once again with the general contractor on the project. Uh, try to point some things out to the general contractor to see if uh, they will take uh, responsibility for the matter uh, without having the, uh, the property owners to undergo litigation or to get compensation. Okay. No, I just want to explain so they know if they're watching tonight, they know what we're doing with these claims. Everybody's aware of that. Pat just reminded me, 14-1 will go along with 14-30. That's why I have 14-30 marked there. Okay. Under discussion, Alderman Manny. Thank you, Your Honor. I would like to pull 14 We should really have a motion for Oh, yeah, let's make a motion. Alderman Groff, I'm sorry. Let's get a motion on the floor. Thank you. 14.30, you're, you're holding, holding one. 14 one's holding for 14.30. Okay. And then it will lie over. All right. Um, then for documents 14.2 through 23, less 14.10, 11, and 14. Right. I would move that all RCs be accepted and adopted, all our O's and communications be accepted and filed. We pass the resolutions and general ordinances and grade ordinances. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All our O's be accepted and filed. Our C's accepted and adopted. Resolutions, general ordinances, and great ordinances be put up under passage. Now, under discussion, Alderman Manning. Thank you. I would like to pull 1421 for separate consideration and vote. Okay, Alderman Manning. I'd like to vote. Uh, I'm going to vote no on this uh, myself and would do so with this uh, desire that we send it back for broader consideration and come back with a new door ordinance that we would include increased access in public parks, at least in some measure, for dog owners, at the same time as we would authorize but limit use on the urban recreational trail, uh, limiting use to the Michigan Avenue point further north, thus keeping uh, dogs away from uh, that area to the south that's periodically heavily trafficked. Uh, so I would have, encourage others to vote no on this uh, for those reasons to come back with a new ordinance uh, proposal uh, in the near future. Thank you. Do, is that a motion, a formal motion to refer back to the committee? No. Did, he, did you it's want a vote to, no. I'm refer, uh, he requesting wants a separate a vote, no. vote on it now. You yeah. just want a separate Okay, right. super. We'll take that first. Uh, Alderman Vanderwill, same thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, on 1421. I just wanted to say that uh, I've gotten a lot of phone calls from people for and against having dogs on the, uh, on the trail along the lake. And if it doesn't work out, the council can change the ordinance back any time. If we get hundreds of phone calls by June, we can change the ordinance and look at the ordinance again then. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Alderman Warner. Uh, 
Thank you, Your Honor. I, I, don't, I don't mind the idea Alderman Manny had of looking at allowing uh, pets in, into some of our parks, other parks and things. I think that might be something we should take a good look at. But this uh, item here, as far as the Sheboygan Urban Recreational Trail usage, came to public protection and safety first and passed in our committee on a vote of 5 to 0. And then I believe it went to uh, Public Works. We sent it to Public Works for their consideration rather than pass it in council so that they would be able to look. And I believe it was a unanimous vote there also. And part of the reasoning behind this is we allow people to walk their, their dogs and cats, I would suppose, uh, all the way up to where the trail starts from both sides on public sidewalks where the same bikers, joggers, and runners, and walkers, and skaters go now. Except when they get there to that recreational trail, they have to walk in the street if they have a dog. And it came to public protection and safety because the officer assigned to that area through community policing was having a real problem forcing dog owners to walk in the street. And there are some people who have concerns about the dogs being on the trail with them. On a recreational trail, I understand that. But I bike that trail and I've walked the trail myself many times and I've never had a problem with dogs that were on there illegally. My guess is, is that we should hold them to the same standard that we do on the rest of our sidewalks and pathways in the city of Sheboygan. And also, if you actually look at the recreational trail in the county, on that trail, they have horses out there, they have rollerbladers, they have dogs, they have, I, I haven't seen anything else, I think, other than that, and, but bicyclists and you name it, joggers and everything, and walkers and kids on bicycles, and the horses and dogs, and there's, there's no problem out there on that trail. And I think that just allowing this trail to be an extension of the sidewalks on either end is probably a wise thing for public safety. Uh, they're not allowed on the beach, they're not allowed uh, in all our other parks, but perhaps some, sometime we should be taking a look at some of these other parts to make parks to make Sheboygan a little bit more pet friendly if possible. So I just think we should send this through. It's been discussed in committee quite a bit and, and I'd like to see it get passed. Thank you. Do you have another discussion, Pat? Would you, you want to roll call on this? Yeah, you it better. Has to be. It has to be, okay. Berg? I Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Manny? No. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Perez? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wongaman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Winninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. 14 ayes, one no. Motion carried. Okay. If there's nothing else, Pat, would you call a roll on the rest of the documents? Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Perez? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Wenninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Ferg? Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carried. 1424 through 27 to be referred. 1428 will hold for 1443. 1429 will lie over. Along with 1430, 31, and 32, and along with 1401. 1433 through 41 to be referred. 1442 and 1443 we will hold in co at council. Lies over. It'll, it will lie over until next meeting. Along with uh, 28. Correct. 28. Along with 28, 1428. Thank you, Don. 1444 and 45 lie over. 1446 through 49 to be referred. 1450 lies over. 1451, by Public Protection and Safety, recommending denying beverage operator license 6175 and 4920 based on their arrest history. Alderman Doyle. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that we accept and adopt the report of committee. Second. Move to second, accept and adopt the report of committee under discussion. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'd like a request to open up the floor to uh, the audience. Uh, Garrett Keefe, uh, one of the uh, persons whose uh, license was being denied would like to speak. And would uh, Mr. Jovanovich like to speak also? Uh, could we have a, a motion to- Move to second, open up the floor. You don't need a motion where- You don't need it. No, you don't. he's automatically allowed okay. to do it. Okay, okay. thank Garrett, you. Garrett, you may speak. 
Uh, first off, I'd like to thank uh, the mayor and everyone on the council for your time here tonight to uh, hear me uh, voice. Um, first off, I realize that I have, um, as most of you uh, can see in the paperwork in front of you, have had my several mistakes in the past. Um, I accept them, I have paid for them, and still paying for them as we speak. Um, but my case in point um, mainly is that um, all of my mistakes have had nothing to do with um, Water Street Pub or my uh, being employed there. They have all been obviously mistakes on my, my time and nothing to do with my occupation. Um, I have been employed by Mr. Johnvich and Water Street Pub now for it will be four years come February. Um, I take my job very serious uh, professionally, um, although it's on a different aspect. Um, I take it as serious as everyone here sitting in this room takes his or her job seriously. Um, Water Street Pub is one of the finest and well-established uh, taverns in this city and I uh, take uh, pride in being employed there. Uh, once again, um, uh, I have been there for four years. I will be going back to school in January to further my uh, education, to further my life and put my, my mistakes in my past and farther behind me than they already are. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say. I thank you for your time uh, once again. I do take my job uh, very professionally. I hate to, to pound out that point, but uh, that's pretty much all I have to say is that um, I do take my job seriously. It is my full-time occupation. I work 35 to 40 hours um, a week for Mr. Janovich. Um, and that is my point, is it is my job, it's my occupation, it's my income, and that's all the time I have. Thank you. On the floor. I move that we allow Mr. Jovanovich to speak. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Please. Thank you very much. All I'd like to say is Garrett's worked with me for four years. Um, at that time, Water Street has only got two people that work 35 to 40 hours. If uh, you do not give him his license, he's no longer able to work for me. He is currently in jail. He's out on Huber. If he doesn't get Huber, he's going to be shipped back to La Crosse. Um, his chance of actually coming back in December after he gets done with jail are non-existent. As a small business owner, I'm going to need to replace him. At that point in time, we're putting another guy in Sheboygan out of a job until hopefully next year. All I'd like to say is Garrett's done really, really well for me. He's never gotten in trouble with the police while he's been at work. Taverns go through after hours, underage drinkers, all that. Out of everything that I've had between both my taverns with employees, Garrett's never once done anything illegal. Not once. Um, he gets in some trouble when he's on his own, not when he's at work. So between Huber and working, I don't think that there's any room for him to mess up. Um, I would not keep anybody who actually can jeopardize my license if I didn't really think that he's responsible at work. So I really, really, really wish you guys would take a look at it and reconsider giving him a part-time license rather than taking away his livelihood. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Alderman Doyle. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Keefe is uh, correct in that his violations were not directly related to the uh, licensing function. Uh, however, they were indirectly related, which means it was a judgment call on the part of the committee. And I'll give you the violations that uh, were of concern to the committee. Uh, he had three underage alcohol uh, uh, violations uh, prior to turning 21. Since uh, turning uh, 21, he's had four OWIs uh, operating uh, a motor vehicle while intoxicated. He's also had uh, damage to property, property, domestic disorderly conduct, and eluding officers. So we felt that uh, his record was of concern. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did you want to take a separate vote on this? You have two licenses here. Yes, I would. Which one are pertaining to? We're, we're going to take uh, Mr. Keefe's uh, first. 4920. First. Okay. Alderman Warner. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. As Chairman of Public Protection and Safety, uh, the umbrella for, for our licensing function, which Jerry Brunson does a very good job at, uh, I just have to say that whenever something like this comes to us, we, we take public safety in, into consideration, and the individual when we look at the record, is it something that we feel real comfortable with? In this case, with Mr. Keefe only being 25 years old and having all these violations, it was a concern to the committee. Uh, what we have done in the past, if someone shows that over a period of six months or a year that they can uh, not get in trouble again and they come back to us, uh, we've 
looked at granting them a license at that time. But these are all very recent. In 2003, there were two of them. Uh, 2001, there was a couple, couple of offenses, and it's just they're so close together, we didn't feel comfortable with it. And by the way, Mr. Keefe can still work. He just can't work alone. He's got to have a licensed bartender on a premises. He can still have a provisional and still work. He just can't close up, can't work alone. So it's just a feeling of the committee is that he should be not denied. Thank you. Alderman Wangelin. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. I, I think one of the violations that concerned the committee the most was eluding police. As you know, this is a very serious violation, and the news is full of horrendous accidents caused by this type of violation every day. And so we looked at this one, and we thought this really showed a very poor judgment on the uh, part of, the, of Mr. Keefe, and it had a, a great effect on uh, our decision. Not that it had anything to do with his bartending, but it does really, I think, demonstrate judgment. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Manny. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I just want you to know I'm going to abstain because Garrett <coughs> is a friend of my son. Okay. Okay, Pat, would you call the roll? And I will be to deny his license. Doyle? Aye. Groff? Aye. Manny? Abstain. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Perez? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangeman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Wenninger? Aye. Bauman? No. Berg? No. Bonet? Aye. Just want to make sure I had it right. Twelve eyes, two noes, one abstention. Motion carried. Okay, next one. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, Mr. Keith, the motion, the uh, license was denied. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, consider the license of uh, Nicole K. Bratz, and she is not an attendant. Okay. Okay. Just no other discussion, Pat. Would you call the roll, please? Graf. Aye. Manny. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Moody. Aye. Perez. Aye. Rinfleisch. Aye. Van Akron. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Wangaman. Aye. Warner. Aye. Winninger. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. Bonet. Aye. Doyle. Aye. Fifteen eyes. Motion carried. Fourteen fifty-two through 54 to be referred. 1455, by finance, recommending amending resolution providing for outside legal services for the Great Lakes Company's project to increase the not to exceed cost of such services. Alderman Groff. Yeah, I'll move that the RC be accepted and adopted and that the resolution be put upon its passage. Sorry. Moved and seconded, RC be accepted and adopted and a resolution be put upon its passage. Under discussion, Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Two questions, two questions. Did the city realize that the costs were going up substantially as they were going up? Second question, any negotiations to reduce the amount asked for? Uh, Marilyn, no, I guess we were caught off guard somewhat. The, uh, the last estimate we got was uh, the number that we had presented to the council uh, back in early May or the end of April, I think we brought it in. It was adopted uh, in May at $120,000. Uh, we weren't being billed on a regular basis. The first uh, bill we received for the whole year service was back in August uh, or September. And uh, the costs did escalate pretty rapidly as we got closer to, to the closing. I guess, uh, uh, you know, you could say a lot of things with hindsight. Uh, if you'd known that it would, would have been that high, would you have done things differently? Perhaps uh, might have monitored things more carefully. But I know there was a time crunch. Uh, there always has been a time crunch that the developer had to get up and going by the PGA next year. Uh, that involved significant amount of time by the outside council and that, that firm, as it got closer to the closing, uh, there was more uh, and more rushed need to complete development agreements and also the, uh, the sub-documents, if you will, the, 
the ground leases, the, the reimbursement agreements and all that stuff. So there was more people at the firm involved. Uh, and that sort of geometrically tends to increase things. Uh, the good news, I, I did check today as far as uh, the amount of fees since since the closing, uh, which was like the end of July, and uh, from from mid-August until now, there's you know we've incurred about six thousand dollars worth of fees. Uh, but uh, as I say, near June and July, um, the meter was going very rapidly and. Uh, I guess I'm not happy about it. I don't think anybody's happy about it, but uh, I've looked at the bills. I don't think there's any issue that the work that they billed us for was uh, actually performed by their firm. As far as negotiation, I did talk to them about that. Uh, they're not willing to negotiate on it. Uh, they did say that if, uh, if we wanted, we could take some period of time in which to pay it. Um, I think our intent was to bond uh, next month for the Blue Harbor project and to include all the TIF expenses or a lot of the TIF expenses in the borrowing. Um, so I don't know that it's, it's something we want to consider as far as stretching out payments. But uh, uh, the firm has told me and their, their uh, sort of designated point person has told me that they feel that the service was rendered, uh, they feel it was professionally performed and so forth, and they're not really in a position to start cutting their fees. Uh, Alderman Vanderwill. Thank questions? you, Your Honor. Uh, just one question. If, you know, I remember we were always waiting for Great Lakes for a very extended period of time. Would it be unethical or wrong to ask them to pay for a portion of the fee? Um, I don't know. I guess that's a council decision. I'd feel a little uncomfortable about doing that after the fact. I think if we were going to do that, that would have been something that we would have negotiated up front. Um, and actually thinking about that and discussed that a little bit, uh, you know, the problem you have in doing that is sort of diluting who they're representing. In other words, if Great Lakes is paying half the bill, then are they really representing us in, uh, to, uh, to our best interests, or are they sort of taking a neutral position and just draft, drafting documents? Uh, you know, the problem we had early on, and, and uh, the one reason why we uh, looked at hiring that firm was Great Lakes was using Foley & Lardner, which is a bond firm that we had been using uh, at that time for bond services. Uh, we had used Quarles and Brady for bond service prior to that, and a lot of the issues that we knew that were going to be addressed were really financial issues and bonding questions and private activity questions and things like that. And, uh, it was kind of a feeling that we had to, uh, you know, pull out pretty good-sized guns to to uh, counterbalance uh, their use of Foley and Lardner firm, uh, and I, I think. Um, while you know the cost is is a big cost, and uh, whether we would have hired them knowing what the cost would have been, I, I don't know. But I do think we were well served by their service. I feel what we ended up with was uh, in the city's best interest as far as agreements. Uh, in the beginning, Foley and Lardner, on behalf of Great Lakes, was pushing to use a, a different, entirely different sort of mechanism for funding through uh, lease revenue bonding that, uh, that was appealing to Foley and Lardner. They had done that before, but uh, we felt was not the way to go because uh, the revenue stream was not secure. Lease revenue bonds work good where you've got like a utility, uh, sewer utility or water utility where you know what the, there's a revenue stream. Uh, here, there wasn't a revenue stream. Uh, and 
our financial consultants were saying that it would probably be an unmarketable sort of product on a lease revenue bond. So anyway, there were a lot of things that went into it, uh, a lot of things that uh, sort of contributed to them spending an awful lot of time. I did go back their, their last month or so, and Ann Coomer was spending, you know, every day, I think the last month she averaged like 10 hours a day, uh, every day of the week, you know, over the entire month of July, weekends and everything, working on this project. And at, uh, at Quarles and Brady rates, that adds up pretty fast. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Your Honor. This is a uh, really tough situation for me to vote for. Um, and I hope that the words I, I am going to speak to you tonight are not misconstrued as being words for personal political gain. Even though the past voting patterns of this com common council assure me that this resolution will pass tonight with flying colors, I am going to vote against the passage of this resolution. Only five months ago, this common council authorized the cost of attorney's fees not to exceed $120,000 in the Blue Harbor project. It was a cap, we were told. Apparently, that cap imposed by this council had very little meaning. The cost we are being asked to approve tonight is more than three times what this council authorized only five months ago. The cost is now $400,000. It has been suggested that the amount, $120,000, was only an estimate. If that is the case, somebody was way out of whack. Moreover, I don't recall a resolution this council passed five months ago mentioning anything being an estimate. At what point during those few months did this city lose control of the attorney fees being charged? At what point did those attorney's fees start to become exorbitant? and grossly excessive of the previously authorized amount. Why was this council not notified that extra services were being required of the attorneys? Where is the $400,000 to pay this bill going to come from? The problem with entering into a business relationship with anybody whereby services are to be rendered only up to a stated amount is when the amount is reached the city has to bargain for further assistance in the midst of a transaction, and the city usually ends up bargaining to its detriment or faced being left out in the cold. Unfortunately, this type of open-ended contracting has been characteristics of the Blue Harbor Project. I never liked it then, and I certainly don't like it now. How many of my fellow aldermen would casually, casually dish out out of your own pocket more than three times the amount of money than you had previously agreed to pay for anything. <coughs> My vote of no tonight is a simple message to this administration. If you are going to deal, deal like the money you're spending is coming directly out of your pocket, not out of somebody else's pocket. And by that, I mean the taxpayer. Thank you. Steve, would you like to reply to that? That this is not the taxpayer's money? You're, well, uh, you're borrowing yeah, this, this, is, this is a TIF project. Uh, these are TIF eligible expenses. Um, That's right. That uh, that doesn't mean they're not coming out of somebody's pocket, but they uh, uh, they're they're pro be project expenses and will be paid back through TIF. increments generated by the project, uh, assuming that there are increments generated from the project. Rich, did you want to comment on this? I think Steve explained it pretty well, but it would be included in the next edit issuance, which is the sale is scheduled for the next uh, council meeting on November 3rd for uh, be, uh, both the tax and criminal district number six debt issuance, approximately $4 million, and then there'll be uh, the bond anticipation notes for the convention center, approximately $8 million will be scheduled for the next council meeting on November 3rd. Mm -hmm. Rich, do you ever remember Alderman Perez said it came out as a cap of $120,000 for spending out of finance, was it? I, I, the, the, I think the resolution said not to exceed. Is not to exceed. The reference uh, was. Okay. Okay. Alderman, yeah. thank you. 
Alderman Monty Mayor. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Steve, for explaining. And, and Alderman Perez, I can understand how you feel. And I also feel that if this is our bill, we must pay. It's as simple as that. And um, a triple oops, of course, certainly hurts. But if it is our bill, we must pay it. And now that you said that the uh, money will come from the TIF, not from our taxes, that helps. But still, oops. Thanks. Alderman Manny. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to put this into broader context and ask David Beebel to speak to the issue of costs that are actually coming in under estimates for things like the promenade. Well, basically the, the contracts that have been let for the public portions of the project, such as the streets, the utilities, the, the sanitary sewers, the promenade, those bids have come in under the original estimates based on, on the TID that was originally developed as a budget. So we're under budget for some of those public improvement projects that we've already been under contract for. So. Um, Rich can maybe explain a little better on how, how that affects the TID budget. There might be excess capacity within the budget, but that, that should have helped. How much under, David? I don't have those right off the top of my head, but I, I, I specifically remember the promenade. I believe it was about $300,000 under budget, as well as the, the roads and, and the utilities. Um, I don't have it right in front of me, but I know it was at least one hundred and fifty to 200000 under the budget. Uh, but like I said, I don't have those right in front of me, but I know those three projects, the, the public improvements, did come under our original estimates. So the money we're spending for legal fees actually were budgeted in the project. But yet, we, if we could have saved on legal fees, we'd have saved that too. I'd have to then refer to the Rich and, and Paulette on the original TID budget, what the grand total was. I know the portion of public construction for the projects that we let came in under budget. So I, I'm not sure of all the legality. There should be excess capacity within that TID budget. And maybe Richard Rich. Paulette. Yeah, I don't have the complete numbers. I have some of the earlier projections, but I don't have everything that has come in since then. But we were looking over uh, about 425,000 for professional services and some of the original projections, but that did have some of the environmental consultants in it also. So it was a combination of, of both the um, legal and the environmental. Um, but as Dave said, there's, there's been you know, various ones that have come in under budget. And uh, this, of course, you know, I, I know it was a very tough process and was very difficult for both sides mm -hmm. to go through. It was much longer than both sides anticipated. Obviously, Great Lakes also in incurred a lot more legal expenses than, than they expected. Um, I think, you know, one plus side is, you know, one thing we had to make sure is that everything the city was protected was covered. And I think Steve and, and Quarles did that quite well. Uh, we also wanted it to be a success and we knew we had to have a complete project, uh, not only with the resort and water park, but also with the 64 condos that would, would be under construction. And we had to have incentives that in place in order for them to do that. And we had to, of course, have them agree to those uh, conditions and those incentives. Um, so there, there is a lot of things that we incurred every step along the way that just took a lot more time than we expected. And, and I think Quarles was very dedicated in doing that and trying to protect the city. Yes, it's a, it's a shocking bill when we got it. Uh, we did not expect it to be that high, but uh, I th think also the product that we got was, was a very quality product from Quarles. Hang on, Rich. Alderman Ryan, flesh. Oh, yeah. uh, no actual question, I'm just a statement. I assume we're going to vote no on this one, but probably not for the reasons why people are, are thinking for it. Um, on my experience on Public Works Committee, I have seen time and time again how our department and our planning and our budgeting, um, the Public Works Department, excuse me, has come under budget a lot of times, only to see those savings be passed on elsewhere. And now the city isn't paying for it out of taxpayers' money. We are going to pay for it out of the 
did district when we ought to bond for it, but there we could have bonded for less, and that savings gets eaten up by, by another, something that has nothing to do with public works, has something to do elsewhere of that. Uh, for that reason, I won't know. Second reason, though, is recently uh, when Orange Cross came back to us and asked for a raise, uh, contractually we had to do it, and much like this situation, I understand we probably have to do it anyway. Uh, it is our bill, like Marilyn Montemayor had said, we must pay it, but we did vote, make a message saying that um, that doing so was unacceptable. And I would like to vote no. I think Quarles and Brady, you're, you're getting the best when you hire them. I think they've done a good job in terms of negotiations with us. But there's no way that they would know that the work that they would have to do for us would be as little as 120000 They should have known from the very beginning it would be a bill about this size. And uh, I feel that they should have come forward with us right away. And I'd like to send them a message. Okay. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just wanted to give the council some idea what happened at, um, at finance committee. We basically asked a lot of the same questions that were, were brought up here and um, uh, Alderman Stefan had brought up the fa fact about um, negotiating with the cost of it and at that time we were told no, but um, Alderman Vanderbilt had mentioned something about asking Great Lakes Company to, to pay some of this and I, I believe it was a feeling of the finance committee, or at least myself, uh, for sure on the Finance Committee that uh, thought, no, we couldn't do that because we were asking Quarles and Brady to protect us from Great Lakes Company, from taking advantage of us and, and from getting us the best deal we could for our citizens and so forth, and that's what we did. I also want to make sure and, and mention um, again that the $400,000 that we are paying, or in this $280,000 difference from what it was originally estimated to be, is, um, is all coming out of the TIF district. It's not coming out of the taxpayer's pocket. Um, and um, it will be included in the borrowings that we are doing in November. Thank you. Alderman Warner. I think I, I guess I, I will vote to support this. I, I don't like it any more than anyone else does. Anytime you have to pay more for something, I had to pay an awful lot to get my brakes fixed on my car last week. I went in for one price, and when I got there, <laughs> it ended up being almost twice as much. And, uh, but in this case, it's unfortunate. I just had one thing I was wondering. You know, we had a lot of special meetings. We had committee of the whole meetings, special council meetings. That all adds to this cost. There was a lot more information that was requested by this council that they had to bring in. We wanted more information on, on one phase of it and other things. And, and they had to come here and, and send, send their people here. And I would just assume that that adds something to the cost of this thing. And you know, you could add that up pretty quick at, I don't know what they get, 100 or more dollars an hour probably. Uh, I don't think it's ever a good thing that you have to do this, but unfortunately it's a bill the city got and like we send tax bills to the people out in the city and we expect them to pay them and, and we have to pay our bills also. Thank you. Alderman Vanderbilt. Thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to say that hindsight is always twenty twenty, and this is just a message that next time we uh, go for outside counseling we just have to be more careful. Thank you. Okay. Pat. Would you go roll, please? Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Perez? No. Rinfleisch? No. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangeman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Winninger? Aye. Fowlman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Groff? Aye. 13 ayes, 2 noes. Motion carried. 1456 by finance recommending distribution disbursement of the city's 2002 and 2003 CDBG funds. Alder McGraw. Your Honor, I'll move that we accept and adopt the RC of the finance committee and that the two resolutions be put upon its passage. Move to second accept and adopt the report of the finance committee and the resolution to be put upon your passage. Is there any discussion on either or? Hearing none, would you call the roll, please? Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Perez? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Winninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Manny? Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carried. 1335 RO by City Plan Commission recommending amending the zoning of property at Excuse me, 1427 South 15th Street, Alderman Warner. I thank your honor. I make a motion to accept and file the report of officer and pass the attached ordinance. Moved and second to accept and adopt 
except in adopt, except in file the RO and pass the attached ordinance under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor, um, I thank you. This is relative to rezoning the property located at 1427 South 15th Street from class neighborhood residential to uh, class urban <coughs> industrial. And I know Alderman Moody has a concern about this. Uh, recently, Leslie Umberger, on behalf of Amy McNeil, inquired about operating and potentially expanding a metal arts studio at 1427 South 15th Street. The property is currently zoned neighborhood residential, and it must be changed to a, uh, urban industrial to allow such a, such a use. And this is one of those things that slipped through with the 1996 zoning update. It, it seems uh, we find one or two of these each year. And these, this, there already is an industrial building on this property, and it has operated that way for many years in the past. But somehow this got put into the neighborhood residential zoning code, and it should not have been. Uh, this is also compatible with the City of Sheboygan's comprehensive plan for the area. So the plan commission recommends approval. Okay, after another discussion, would you call the roll, please? Moody? Aye. Perez? Aye. Rinsleich? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Longerman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Wenninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonnet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Manny? Montemayor? Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carried. 1357, a resolution by Alderman Groff, Winninger, Stefan, Doyle, and Bonet, transferring funds to establish estimate, estimated revenue and appropriation for business development loan to I and Z Properties, Inc. Alderman Groff. Now I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Moved and seconded, a resolution be put upon its passage under discussion. Alderman Van Akron. Your Honor, I just want to know where, what is this? Is this the motel and the restaurant on 8th Street? You got 922. This is for the, the Fountain Park. Fountain Park, motel. Correct. They're remodeling or are they done? They're done, I believe. Correct. <coughs> Thank you. Another discussion, will you call the roll, please? Perez? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Wenninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Groff? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carried. 1457, we'll go to finance. Steve? 1458 is a communication from Ron Van Royen, president of RCS, relative to a bill for grass cutting at 1221 St. Clair Avenue. That will go to finance. 1459 is a communication being a petition from Marty Butson et al. supporting the effort of Screamers Tavern to keep their race car sign on their lower roof. We will take that to plan commission. 1460 is a resolution authorizing signing an easement for a mini storm sewer to be constructed in a portion of property at 3907 South 17th Place. Public Works. 1461 is a committee report by the Special Committee on Risk Management uh, with respect to Mead Public Library participating in the city's medical prescription drug and dental benefit programs effective that, in 2004. That will lie over. Moved and seconded adjourned under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye.